Because we're getting ready to start a brand new series this week. Um, I, I wanted to really do something that would catch your attention. I don't want you to miss what we're talking about for the next four weeks. When we talk about the real F word, what I want you to understand is there are words in our English language that are considered taboo. And most of us, the immediate thought is when we hear the real F word, we immediately think the way we have been ingrained to think by the society in which we live. The society in which we live says bad, all right? The real F word. But can I tell you something? There are a slew of words in the dictionary and not in the dictionary that begin with the letter F. Amen? I was already chided, if you will, by, uh, or rebuked, if you will, by uh, a friend from Tennessee who said to me, man, that's a little too edgy. It wasn't Chad. <laughs> But I, I, he said, it's a little too edgy. He said, are you moving away from the gospel altogether? And I said, you would be entirely wrong. If you've listened to any of my sermons, you would know that I am not the guy who would ever move away from the gospel. If anything, I dive into the gospel and never bring us back up for air, all right? The gospel is all-encompassing. It's where we live our lives because we've been changed by it. But what I do understand is there is an area of our lives that is affected when we struggle with the F word, forgiveness. It is not one area of our life, but it is every area of our life that is affected by it. Either because today we live in one of two camps, or maybe both. One is, maybe we're here today, or maybe you're on the iCampus today. And maybe you're in the camp of people who need to receive forgiveness. Maybe you've messed up in your life. Maybe you've jacked your life all to pieces and it's horrible. You've made some horrible mistakes. You've really done some really bad things in your past. And your closet is full of skeletons that you wouldn't want anybody else to know. But you're struggling because you need forgiving. Or maybe you live in the camp today of somebody... Who needs to give forgiveness? You see, I, I've learned something about people. We all want to be forgiven, but very rarely do we want to be the one to forgive. See, there is something about not forgiving somebody that feels like we're in control. That, that feels a little bit powerful, if you might. Because if I don't forgive you for something you've done to me, then in a sense, I get to hold something over your head and I will never let you forget it. But can I tell you what that too often sounds like to me? Satan. Because the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. What does Satan do to you? Satan is all the time digging up your past and throwing it in your face, isn't he? Isn't that what he does? Never, ever will you see throughout Scripture God ever digging up your past and throwing it in your face. In fact, if you look at the whole totality of the Scripture, what you see is, is that God is not really concerned about your past. God is focused on your future and where you're going. Amen? That's the God we serve. But the enemy knows <laughs> that you and I will never live the potential of our future as long as we're reminded of our past. Amen? So he's always throwing the past up into our faith. You can get somebody saved. Man, they get gloriously saved. And by the way, you know, you know how what determines if somebody gets excited about Jesus or not? How much they've been saved from. 
You, you, you know, because nobody knows the oil, the cost of the oil in your alabaster box. Amen? Only you. Only you know what it took. For you to get where you are. Only you know what it took for you to save what you've saved. Only you know what it took for you to fall at the feet of Jesus and pour yourself out on the Savior. Nobody else knows that but you. So when somebody begins to question me, and this thing is driving me nuts. <laughs> telling you what. Sorry, I know some of y'all look at me and say, what in the world can you keep messing with his ear for? I don't have a tick, I promise you. <laughs> I've got something going on with this thing on my ear and it's driving me nuts. But never for me, never do I worry about what people think. It doesn't bother me. Somebody said, well, you get a little excited. and you, you, I notice you, 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 preacher, you stand on the furniture sometimes. <laughs> well, it'll vacuum off, right? My shoes are clean. I don't care if I stand on the furniture. I don't care if I run. I don't care if I shout. I don't care if I jump. I don't care if I get excited. You know why? Because I've got a joy that the world didn't give me. And the world can't take it away. Amen? But unforgiveness can. I want you to understand something today. I want you to get some first things first. If you will, it might be kind of forgiveness 101. All right? Here's what you must get today. Forgiveness is 98% about you. And about the person receiving it, about 2%. And in fact, that might be liberal in the 2%. I believe that forgiveness is one of the greatest principles in life. Jesus modeled it when he hung on the cross and he prayed for the very people who had put them there. And he says in Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34, I love this passage. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Man, what a model example. That even the people who crucified him, oh, but, but I thought you said that we didn't crucify him. No, no. Our sin did. Our sin did. But he still looks at us and says, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. His words were so powerful and unexpected that it brought about the conversion of one of the thieves hanging on a cross next to him. Because when Jesus forgives... He completely forgives. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow his example. He wants to lead for us, if you may. So I begin to try to grasp this whole thing of what you and I are really looking at over the next four weeks in the real elf word. I say, you know, Lord, we really need to uh, land this thing really soon close to the ground. Uh, 101, we got to give people the basics because most people struggle in the area of forgiveness. And, and most people won't even recognize that they struggle. Most people, if they recognize it, are too prideful to admit it. But forgiveness is hard. It's messy. It's long-lasting. It's not something you do once, boom, and it's over. So in grasping this principle and trying to understand this principle, I think that first of all, we must dive in to understand our need. Our need. It's not a want. But it's a need. When I think of what I really need in my life, I need forgiveness. I, I cannot live without it. I must have it. I need forgiveness. Look at Romans chapter 5. 
verse number 12. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. The scripture says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Skip down to verse number 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. If we could go all the way back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We go back to the beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden and the fall of all mankind. The garden was created for Adam and Eve to live in forever. Do you realize that Adam and Eve were never created to die? They were to live forever. Can you imagine that? They were to live absolutely forever. I'm about to get a microphone and go Pentecostal style here in a minute. This is about to drive me nuts. Never have this problem with this microphone. Satan, get thee behind me. Goodness. Can you imagine being Adam and Eve in the garden? Wrinkles were never supposed to be a thing. No wrinkle-free cream for them, right? I mean, they, they, they were meant to have beautiful skin. They were meant to be healthy. They were meant to... You know, be physically fit. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that's when fat came in the picture. (laughs) Seriously, Chad. I I, I really believe that, that Adam and Eve were skinny. I believe that. Healthy, skinny. And the moment they ate of that tree, the fruit of that tree, immediately, boom, you fat now. (laughs) Right? I mean, you want to know where fat came from. Listen, fat came from evil from the fall. Without the fall, you and I wouldn't be in the shape we're in. Because when they fail, immediately the Bible says they recognize they were naked. Before that, they were naked and beautiful and never even noticed. Now they're fat and naked and they're like, oh Lord, cover that up. Right? Yeah. Let's just be honest here. And God said, who told you? You were naked. Who told you you were naked? Because they had no clue before. So here's what I'm going to do to you folks. Adam, Eve, I love you. But you can't stay in the garden. You've got to get out. And now your work is going to be hard. Laborious. You're going to work By the sweat of your brow. Oh, by the way, Eve, child labor, not going to be easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, So all of you ladies that have had a child and you know what I'm talking about, when you get to heaven, you're going to have a little talk with Eve. Amen? Because it's her fault. It's his too, but... I think women ought to take it out with women, you know? Yeah. Because from that moment forward, nothing ever has been the same. Their sin demanded payment. The penalty or the payment for the sinful nature from Adam and Eve on... Every single person born from Adam and Eve on, we're descendants. They're in our lineage. We're in their lineage, whatever you want to call it. We were born with a sinful nature. 
Somebody said to me the other day, they said, oh, I have never done anything wrong. I said, you just did. You just did. I mean, the scripture even says, listen, if you say you have no sin, you are deceived. Amen? You've already lied to yourself. You've already lied. You've done it right then. And guess what? If you've broken one of the commandments, how many have you broken? All of the commandments. Dang, man. We thought we was on a roll. Some of us guys, we just thought we were perfect. Amen? Goodness. But Romans 6.23 is really clear. For the wages of sin is death. But, man, I am so thankful that sometimes the but gets in the way. <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I tell you something? What you and I need today is forgiveness. We need forgiveness. Now, I need you to understand something. This is going to come in handy in a few minutes, all right? When we talk about forgiveness, there are two types of forgiveness. There is a judicial forgiveness, and there is a parental forgiveness. If you go to Israel, you'll understand this because of the court systems in Israel. There is a judicial forgiveness or pardon, if you will. When you and I, as a lost individual, as an individual who has lost our way, as an individual who has a sinful nature, because we need forgiveness, we come to God and God forgives us based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is a judicial pardon. It is a judicial forgiveness. It means he forgives us of every sin, past, present, and future. It is a judicial forgiveness. But then there is a parental forgiveness. Hold that thought. I'm going to get there in just a moment. I needed you to understand that judicial forgiveness is what happens when you and I come to Christ and we receive Him as Lord and Savior of our lives. That is the blood sacrifice, if you will, and therefore that is number two, that is God's provision. Because I need forgiveness, because I cannot save myself, because I'm human, because I'm wretched, because I have a sinful nature. And don't you look at me so spiritual. <laughs> we are all rotten to the core. Amen? We all have this sinful nature about us. Because of that, we need forgiveness. And I'm so thankful that God steps in and says, I'm going to make provision for what you need. I'm going to take care of that. Look with me in Romans chapter 5. Look at verses 6 through 11. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That was me, that was you. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I love this. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Isn't that good? Woo, man, it'll preach. Verse number 9 deals not only with the blood fluid of Jesus, but it rather refers to the Old Testament imagery of the sacrificial system. They would, the Jews would bring sacrifices to the temple. And they would sacrifice animals for the forgiveness of their sins. Aren't you thankful we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore? 
Amen? I'm not a good hunter, all right? I'd be the one they'd be price gouging at the temple, all right? Not good. I'd get taken, I'd be taken advantage of all the time. I'd be scammed, if you would. Remember John the Baptist spoke from the side of the Jordan River, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, Jesus is walking by. We were standing in the very spot, the very area in front of the Jordan River, and we literally could look and see where Jesus would have walked by, and John looked and said, Hey, hey! Because see, John had his own disciples. People were following John. People were listening to his teachings. And immediately, as John's baptizing in the Jordan River, John says, Oh, whoa, hold up, hold up, look. Behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, I'm going to show you something in just a moment. The sin that John's talking about is the sin that required judicial forgiveness. It is the sinful nature that John is talking about. Jesus died to remove our sinful nature. Not remove it in the fact that no more, it's gone, you don't see it anymore. But to say, I'm moving it out of the way, it still exists. Hello? We still mess up. We still fail often, right? Yeah, we still have a sinful nature about us. But what he has now done is he's taken his righteousness and he has set it right down in the midst of us. Amen. And he says that sinful nature shall be conquered by the blood of the Lamb. So when somebody says, and you've heard me say this before, I'm just saying it again. When somebody says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, you're wrong. I am no longer a sinner. But by the blood of the Lamb, I have been made a saint that is capable of sinning. I'm not a sinner. Hated that. You know, when somebody go to, the, to AA or, or they go and they, they say, hi, my name's Dwayne and I'm an alcoholic. I would tell guys, I'd say, don't you say that. I don't care what they want you to say. Don't go in there and repeat that because you are speaking death over you. You are no longer an alcoholic. If God has set you free, if God has delivered you, he's removed that from you, you are no longer an alcoholic. You, my dear friend, you are now alcohol free. Don't you speak that over yourself. I'm not speaking that. Some of us, well, you know, I'm, I'm still a, a sinner. I'm not a sinner. I'm a saint. That's what the Bible teaches us. We move from being sinners to saints, but we are still capable of sinning. In the Old Testament, until the death of Jesus Christ... Every year people would go to Jerusalem. We talked about the celebrating the Passover and the lambs that were used there uh, for the Passover. They were raised in Nazareth. They were raised in Jerusalem. Interesting fact how that when they came to celebrate the Passover, only lambs that were acceptable were raised in Nazareth, in Bethlehem. They couldn't receive lambs from anywhere else in the world. They had to come from that particular region. They'd be brought to the priest to sort through them to find the ones that were suitable for the sacrifice. Aren't you thankful that Jesus became the sacrificial lamb once and for all? Once and for all. That's all it took. It was over with. And he keeps us, as the scripture declares, that Christ was once for all delivered. Great news. Great news. I need forgiveness. God has provided a lamb. Amen. He's provided the one only sacrifice. 
and I have been declared free and pardoned from my sinful nature. And now the blood of the Lamb helps me to overcome that sinful nature. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So let me ask you a question. Why should we forgive others? Wait, wait, wait. Pastor, you, you, just, you just took a strong left turn. I, I, don't, I don't mean to throw anybody off the bus. Let me help you get back on the bus. If you can't get the first two, you won't understand the why. If you don't understand that we all have a need for forgiveness... If you don't understand God's provision to meet that need for forgiveness, you will never understand why we forgive others. You'll never get it. It'll never make sense to you. Just won't. In Mark chapter 11, verse number 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Now I want you to listen very, very closely because I am about to dismantle something that you have been taught and you have believed all of your life. But it was wrong. You ready? Some of y'all look at me like, I don't know if I'm ready or not. Here's what I strongly have difficulty with. People have preached for years. This passage of scripture completely out of context. If you read that, what it sounds like is that if I don't forgive you, then God won't forgive me. Forgive me of what? This is where you must understand the difference between judicial forgiveness and father forgiveness. Judicial forgiveness is not this. Judicial forgiveness is by the blood of the Lamb. Understand this. This scripture is not talking about the ability for you or I to lose our salvation and not make it into heaven. But some would preach, some would believe, if I don't forgive Dustin then even though I've been born again, God's not going to forgive me and I won't get into heaven. That verse is not saying when he says that your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins too. You must look at the word sins. In the Hebrew, there is the word sin and there is the word sins. The word sin is actually plural and it means judicial sin. In other words, common language, it is the nature of sin. That, the word sins, S-I-N-S, is a Hebrew word that literally means action of sins. That is the fatherly forgiveness we're about to get to. When God made provision through Jesus Christ, Jesus saves you and I from our sinful nature, putting us in the family of God, and he does it solely on the basis of the substitutionary work of God through Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. Woo! Hallelujah! Man, that's good stuff. It is not based on your actions. If it were based on your actions to lose it, 
then your actions would be able to obtain it. And you cannot. The Bible says you and I cannot earn our salvation. We can't do anything to earn it. And we can't do anything to lose it. Now hang on a second. I see some of your wheels turning. See, that's different for you. Because what we do is we read the scripture and we put all forgiveness in one category. We put all sin and sins in one category. But if you go back to read the Hebrew, then you understand the differences and it is categorized out. Not that sin is categorized out because it's not. It is sin nature and then our action of sins. Okay? Hang with me. Don't lose me here. Watch where we're going. How do I know this? Because the scripture teaches, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Our sinful nature is covered by the blood of Jesus, and that is what saves us. It is by the blood of the Lamb that I'm going to make it through. It is not by uh, how many sins I didn't commit or how many sins I did commit. In the sinful nature, all of my sins, past, present, and future, have been accounted for. The penalty's been paid. The debt was paid. Now watch this. Why do we forgive others? 1 John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness or wickedness. In the New Living Translation. So many people take 1 John 1, 9 and they use that verse in a salvation context. But that is not salvation context. 1 John is believed to be written, the epistle of the book of 1 John is believed to be written by John the Baptist because how closely it is related, how it lines up to the book of John and the wording that he uses. He uses gentle, loving, kindness, beloved, those sorts of phrases. And so that's how we know that it most likely is John because there's so many similarities in there. And so we look at the book of 1 John, the epistle of it, we would understand this. The book of 1 John is not written to those who are out of the faith. It is written to those who are in the faith. So when John is writing in 1 John 1, 9, but if we, who is we? We is not those who are lost. He is saying in the context of the church, but if we, being the body of Christ, Confess our sins to him. Wait a minute. I thought I was already saved. I was. Because of judicial forgiveness. I'm born again. I am blood bought by the remission of the blood of Jesus. I'm saved. So what's this talking about? If we confess our sins, S... Actions to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, S, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness or all wickedness. Watch this, do not miss this. This passage of scripture is referring to the daily confession and forgiveness. Of sins as a child of God. Wait a minute, Pastor D. If my sins are already forgiven, why must I confess my sin? Watch this. Sin being the daily acts of sin, not the nature of sin. So in order for you and I to walk day by day in fellowship with God and with our fellow believers, we must confess our sins. Well, what sins are you talking about? Sins of commission? Sins of omission, sins of thought, sins of action, secret sins, public sins, and the list goes on and on. We must drag those sins out into the open before God, call them by their names. Lord, please forgive me for all of my sins. Does not cut it. 
Did you sin blanket sin? No. So why would you did, did you did you lie as a blanket sin? No. You lied. God forgive me for lying to so and so today. But you know how you know why we don't do that? Because that hurts. I don't know about you, but when I come to God, I just want to say, God, forgive me for all of my sins. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. Woo! You know why? That's a scapegoat. We just slide right under the covers there and we get out scotch-free. That is not what God's asking us to do here. He wants you and I to confess our individual sins. God, I lied today and I'm sorry. I'm forsaking that. Lord, I stole from someone today. Please forgive me for that. I forsake that. Lord, I looked at pornography. He, he want me to share that too? Yeah. And I shouldn't have. Because it dishonored my wife. It dishonored my girlfriend. It dishonored my daughters. It dishonored my mama. Forgive me, and I forsake that. God, I just looked at a woman and I lusted today. Oh, Lord, does he want me to share that too? Good Lord. Yeah, yeah. See, we, we sin individually. Therefore, we should confess individually. Let me ask you a question. If your kids were to come to you and just say, Hey, Mama. Hey, Daddy. Please forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. Would that fly in your house? No. Wouldn't fly in my house either. I'd say, hey, let me ask you a question. Did you lie to me? Daddy, forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. No, no, no. Did you lie to me? Forgive me for everything. Come here. Come here. Get up here. Did you lie to me? What pie? What pie? You know, I... Mm. Somebody said, now you ought not do that. We're going to call, we're going to call DCF on you. Wrong guy. Listen, I gave life to them. You know what my mama said? Son, I brought you into this world. Ha, bless God, I can take you out. Amen? Call them if you want to call them. You'll be dead and buried by the time they get here. God, forgive me for what I just said. Somebody from DCF is watching, and I'm going to jail after this is over. What I'm trying to say is this. As you and I sin individually, we should confess individually. Okay? True confession not only means just naming them. Anybody can name them. But it involves forsaking them. When you you and I uh, uh, confess before God, what it means is we we are literally dragging them out in the open before God. We're calling them by their names. We're taking sides with God against them. And we are forsaking them. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have prosper. Mercy. Man, do you realize that when we do that, we can then claim the promise that God is faithful and just to forgive? He is faithful in the sense that He's promised to forgive and He will abide by His promise. He is just to forgive because he has found a righteous basis for forgiveness in the substitutionary work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. The forgiveness that John speaks about here is parental. It's parental, not judicial. Parental. When we think about parental, parental is forgiveness as a father forgives a child, as a mother forgives a child. The penalty for our sins already been paid for. 
by the blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. That's already been paid for. But as far as the fellowship and the family of God is concerned, the sinning saint needs parental, parental forgiveness. And that is simply this, forgiveness from his father. And you get it by confessing sin. We need judicial forgiveness only once. And that takes care of the penalty of our sins, past, present, and future. But we need parental forgiveness ongoing throughout our Christian lives. Watch this. When we confess our sins, we must believe on the authority of the Word of God that He forgives us. And beloved, if He forgives us, we must be willing to forgive ourselves. You can't hold it over your head. When you've been forgiven by the Father, you've got to loose it and let it go. Let me give you an illustration. I got a backpack here. And I have some stones. Hey, Trevor, can you come help me? I should have loosened this thing up. Let me get you help here just a second. We're going to put this thing on my back. Okay. <laughs> help me out here. Oh. Okay. I think this is made for a skinny guy. <laughs> All right. Here's what I want you to see. These rocks represent... Sin in my life. Trevor, I'm going to tell a little lie. Pick up a little rock and put in there. Okay. All right. Felt that. But I can still move around. I can still do everything I need to do. No struggle. Everything. I, I got a little bit of weight. But no big deal. It's just a little lie. No big deal. Nobody ever know it. Just me. Got on my computer and looked at some things I probably shouldn't have looked at today. Oh, oh, that's a big rock, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, I felt that one. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's a little heavier. All right. I stole some money out of the offering box this morning. They didn't know I got Pastor Jeff. Oh, I need a Starbucks or two this week. Whew. That's getting a little heavier. Go ahead and put another rock in there. I won't tell you what I called Brother Bob this morning. I don't know, but I'll tell you what. That's a little uncomfortable right now. The more I carry that, it seems like the heavier it gets. You ever notice that? Sin's that way. The the heavier, the, the longer you carry it, the heavier it gets. Yep. Miss Eleanor don't don't know this, but she did something to offend me. Made me really mad, and I'm carrying the grudge against her. That's that's getting heavy. Starting to pull me back a little bit. Yeah. My wife and I got into an argument this morning. He didn't even let me finish that one. Yeah, wham! (laughs) You were talking to Miss Cheryl this morning before we started, weren't you? Good Lord. Hey, stay out of this, please. I got this. I got this. She's like two of them. Throw two of them in there. Man, man. Yeah. This morning I was cut off by a driver on the way here. I learned sign language today. (laughs) Man. I don't know about you. That's getting heavy, Pastor Jeff. I don't know if I could run like this. I, mean, I don't run anyways, you're right. Uh, but I mean, uh, just, just walking, it's, it's getting heavier. It's getting heavier. I told another lie right there, didn't I? <laughs> getting hard to run. Told another lie. Go ahead and put another rock in there. <laughs> Gee, yeah. <clears throat> Man. I think I'm going to print me up some t-shirts. I have a, I have a little problem right, every now and then with my language. And I get me some t-shirts that say, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. You probably ought to throw a rock in there because I probably said enough to earn two or three rocks right there. Whew. 
I don't know what. It, you know, Chad, that's getting heavy. Whew. It's pretty heavy. Go ahead and put the rest of those in there. I'm sure I've got some other sin that I can't even think about right now. Good Lord. Maybe I should have not said that. Okay, now, here's what I need you to see. Do you see what's happened? Here's what you and I are doing when we do not confess our sin to God. We are walking around just like this. Does it affect you? It does me. I mean, right now, it's slowing me down. I, I would try to run, but I'm thinking I'll hurt something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean th- this is not cool at all. It's heavy. It's heavy. But, Trevor, come help me again. <clears throat> As I confess this sin one by one, take it out. Lying. Stealing. Cursing. Lust. Pornography. Drunkenness. Getting in an argument with my wife, telling her what I really think about her. Stealing out of the offering plate. Because I, I, I didn't bring the tithe, I just stole it. I took God's money. Wow. Sign language. Go ahead and take the rest of those out of there. Oh, yes. Uh, don't forget Eleonora. Yeah, that, that grudge against Eleanora. Here's what happens. I'm now free to walk. I'm now free in fellowship with you. Because here's what happens. When I have not confessed the sin of the grudge against Miss Eleanora, every time I see Miss Eleanora, I'm going to snub her and go the other way. You know why? I got a grudge against her. What that means is every time I see her, I'm going to be reminded of what she did to offend me. Here's how this happens. This is how Miss Eleanor could sit over on this side of the church, and I could sit over on this side of the church, and we never speak or fellowship. You know why? Because I got a grudge against her, and I ain't letting it go. I ain't doing nothing until she comes to me and apologizes for what she's done to me. You know what the problem is? She don't even know she's done anything to me. I'm carrying around a load of rocks, the sinfulness because of the grudge that I've got in my heart for her. All I need to do is, I need to, help me get this thing off here. (laughs) Thanks, brother. What I need to do is, is I need to forgive her for what she's done to me. She don't even know what she's done to me. How do I deal with that? How do I forgive her? I know I'm going over, but i got to tell you this. Matthew 18 is in the book for a reason. If you go to Matthew 18, it tells you how to deal with a brother who has sinned against you. How to deal with a brother or sister who has offended you. We go to them one on one. I don't go in the middle of a great big crowd like this and say, Hey, Miss Eleanor, I need to talk to you. You've offended me. Here's what you've done to me. Number one, it ain't none of anybody else's business. I said it ain't none of anybody else's business. Now, if Miss Eleanor says to me, I don't know what you're talking about. I I don't remember doing that. It doesn't matter to me if I hurt you or not. Then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. Come on, Bailey. Oh, you don't need your shoes. Come on, you're good. You're good. You're on holy ground, sister. Miss Eleanor, I brought Bailey because I, I need to be heard by you. Now, it's just me, Miss Eleanora, and Bailey. Nobody else is here right now. Okay? Why do we do it this way? Because it ain't none of anybody else's business. Right? Why bring the whole world into this when it is only between me and Miss Eleanora? I, I went to her first. She did not hear me. She did not receive it. Now I'm bringing a witness. I'm bringing Bailey. Bailey's here not to get involved, not to put her opinion in. She's here to listen and be a witness. Now I'm sharing with Miss Eleanor again. And I'm telling her where she has offended me, where she has hurt me. 
And now she has the opportunity to say, Pastor D, I, I had no idea that I even offended you. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't even realize that I said that or that it came across that way. Please forget, do you realize that most offenses are nothing but miscommunication? Yeah. Miscommunication. Yeah. So now that we've been heard, Bailey's really not needed. She's here for a witness, and she has witnessed a beautiful act of grace, Matthew 18, in action. Yeah. Thanks, Bailey. Yeah. Now, if for some reason Miss Eleonora says, I still don't have a clue what you're talking about. The scripture says, then you take it to the church. Okay? Now, here's typically how we do that here at Graceway. We would go to the church representatives, which would be the leadership team. They would, we would sit in the room with the leadership team, and I would share with Miss Eleanor and give her a third opportunity. Do you see grace in action here anywhere? It wasn't just the first time that I went to her and she's like, oh, you don't want to hear me? Fine, let's take this outside. Me and you're going to deal with this. I would never do that because I guarantee you she can take me. All right? I'm just saying. <laughs> right? She, she got me. I, I know it. Yeah. But, but, but that's what we'd want to do. Grace says, and God's all about grace. Amen? Matthew 18. One-on-one, -on -one, take a witness then take it to the church. Now, if it doesn't happen there, typically what could happen is, is I literally could come on a Sunday morning right here before I start my message and say, before we get started, I need to take care of an item of business. Miss Eleonora offended me. Here's what you did to offend me. Can we work this out? And if she says, no, no, I, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I refuse. I'm not doing this. This is where the scripture says, at this point, we would now say, Miss Eleonora, you are not able to worship here any longer. Now, some people would go, where's grace in that? There were three opportunities for grace. Paul says that when we disfellowship them from the church, it is not... For her complete destruction. It is for her restoration to the body. For when she's at home three or four weeks, a month, two months, and she realizes what all she's missing in the family of God, Paul says the ultimate goal is always restoration. For her to come back and say, Pastor D, I'm sorry. I was bullheaded. I shouldn't have said those things. I shouldn't have done those things. Will you please forgive me? And now, because it's going to the body, you know what we do? She comes to the front. I come to the front. We publicly forgive each other. We embrace one another. We love on each other. And the body gathers around and prays over us. And guess what? We have a beautiful display of God's grace. But true believers should never get to the second, third, or fourth stage. It ought to all be taken care of one-on-one. -on -one. But you know why it doesn't happen like that? Because we'll go tell everybody else about what Miss Eleanor did to us, but we'll never go to Miss Eleanor. You know why? We're too chicken. But here's the deal. If we follow the Scripture... Number one, I have to confess to God my grudge against her and ask God to forgive me before or if I've gone to her or not. I still have to ask God to forgive me for that. And then when God forgives me for that, guess what I have to do now? i got to go and forgive her. Doesn't matter what she did to me. Doesn't matter whether she meant to do it or whether she didn't mean to do it. I still have to forgive her. Why do I have to forgive her? So that he'll take the rock out of my bag. And I live freedom in my life. So when we look at 1 John 1 and 9, that's the reason we understand that this is talking about the daily sins of living out our lives so that we can forgive others because God has already forgiven you and I first.
We can't forgive others in and of ourselves, but only through the grace and forgiveness that God's already extended to us. Let me give you one last scripture and I'm done. So finally, in Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Folks, should I tell you something? Unforgiveness will hinder your prayers and it'll hinder your walk with God and make you totally ineffective for the kingdom. You really want to know why our churches are not more effective than what they are? I believe it has a great deal to do with that one key word, forgiveness. We carry around way too many grudges. Have you heard what she said to me? Did you know how he treated me? He did this to me. He said that to me. Folks, quit wearing your feelings on your shoulders. Let it go. Let it go. We've all been guilty of gossip. We have. We've all been guilty of gossip. We've all been guilty of destroying somebody else's character. We've all been guilty of lying. We've all been guilty of something to hurt other people. Now, I'm going I'm I'm to touch on something that's huge. There is no hurt like church hurt. When you get hurt by the church, it'll cause you to leave the church. And here's why. We can't understand why people who should not act the way they do have acted the way they did. Because if they're children of God, they shouldn't act like that. If they really are followers of Jesus, that is not characteristic of the way followers of Jesus act. And so our expectations on other people cause us to get hurt. Daniel, you better start playing. (laughs) Let me tell you right here. Pastor Jeff, I love this guy. He is anointed. He is a man of God. But I can't put too many expectations on him. Because because the truth is, he's still a man. He's still flesh and blood. And as much as he loves me, and I know he loves me, as much as he supports me, as much as he's in my corner... If I put too many expectations in him, he's still going to fail me. He's going to do something to disappoint me. He's going to say something that I don't agree with. He's going to do something that makes me mad. You with me? And then I'm going to act out in the flesh, and I'm going to need to be forgiven. So let me just tell you how you keep from church hurt. Don't put too many expectations on each other we're just people broken jacked up messed up people with a loving big God that takes us where we are and he heals us people always say oh Pastor D I'm telling you Pastor D you're amazing you're this you're that can I tell you something As much as I love to hear all that, my flesh loves all that. Can I tell you something? I'm not all that. I'm not. I'm just like you. You know why people get upset and get hurt by pastors who fall? Because we lifted that pastor so high up on a pedestal, and we put him way up here, and we said, Woo, look at him, look at him. Can I tell you, when he falls, the higher up you push him, the farther he has to fall. But a pastor falls just like you do. He gets caught in sin just like you do. He lies just like you do. Does he mean to? Hopefully not. 
but it happens. I get mad just like you do. I get frustrated just like you do. Spiritual maturity helps us understand that we should control it. Self-control. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Now, some of us that don't have that matured fruit, we don't control it as well. When we get angry, man, we lash out against somebody else, and the next thing you know, we got some unforgiveness going on. Right? Be careful about your expectations. Don't ever put somebody up so high that they have a long ways to fall. We all fail. We all make mistakes. Every single day, I mess up. And you know what I do? I don't need you to ring me out over it. I do a really good job myself. Just like you. So here's the question this morning. Maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online and maybe you've never received the judicial pardon and forgiveness for your sin. Meaning you've never surrendered your life to God. You've never trusted Him to be your Lord and your Savior. You've never followed Jesus. You've never received the gift of salvation. I want you to know today, this morning, right now, today is the day of salvation. You can have it for the asking. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from our sinful nature. Born again. Blood-bought. Redeemed. All you have to do, surrender your life to Jesus. Call on the name of the Lord. Tell him, God, I'm a poor, wretched sinner. Forgive me for all of my sins. Wash me white as snow. And help me to live my life for you. I'm turning from all of that, God, and I'm turning to you. But maybe you're here this morning. And maybe you need to forgive forgiveness. Maybe you need to give forgiveness maybe you're here this morning and somebody has offended you maybe somebody didn't meet your expectations and they hurt you maybe they did something and it was a miscommunication maybe they maliciously intended to hurt you One of the greatest acts of forgiveness I ever saw was in the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. A lady whose brother had been murdered. And in the courtroom she said, I do not wish for this man to die. What I wish is that this man would give his heart and life to Jesus and his life would be changed. Do you know the judge granted her wish? The man gave his heart and life to Jesus and he sings in the choir right beside her every week. She sings beside the guy who killed her brother how in the world could she do that is she crazy no she's being like Jesus she knew there was nothing that could bring her brother back but if he could be saved it would at least make one life different for the death of her brother that's forgiveness so are you holding a grudge today maybe it's a grudge at your children your parents your siblings listen forgiving somebody doesn't mean making what they did to you okay doesn't make it okay it means you are unlocking the door and you're freeing yourself You're not going to allow their actions to keep you in prison anymore. You're going to open the door. You're going to come out free as a bird. Listen, what they did is between them and God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But God wants you to live forgiven. 
God wants you to live peace. And let me tell you, when you forgive them, it doesn't mean you have to go back in and say, okay, I'm going to give them an opportunity to come back in and do it to me all over again. No, 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 hear me on this. Sometimes you need to forgive and then learn how to love at a distance. Amen? Sometimes you just need to say, listen, hurt me once, shame on you. But you do it a second time, shame on me. I love you, I forgive you, but I'm going to love you at a distance now. Boundaries. Self-care. Have some boundaries. It's okay for you to say, listen, I'm going to put some boundaries in place. I'm not going to be foolish enough to let you do that to me again. Okay? Stand to your feet all over this house. Father God, in the name of Jesus right now, I believe you've spoken to some hearts and lives today. God, thank you that you poured some truth through your servant today. God, I, I, I needed, God, God, I needed so bad your help this morning. Father, you gave it to me. I felt it flowing through my veins. God, there are people here in this house, there are people on iCampus today that, Lord, number one, they need to be saved and born again. They need judicial forgiveness. But, God, there are some people in this house today that they have been filled with unforgiveness. They've been carrying grudges. They've been carrying a root of bitterness. And today, they need to release it and let it go. They need to give forgiveness today so they can walk out of here free. Father, have your will in your way, God, right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together, these altars are open.